to everyone online if the rain prevented you from coming. We're so glad that you've joined us as well. Before what I get into what I want to share this morning, next week uh, we're launching a brand new series called The Daily Grind. And I'll be launching this series with a sermon called um, Embrace the Daily Grind. Because let's be honest, sometimes a day or a week and a month just feel like you've got to grind it out, like it's a tough grind. And we want to talk about how can you actually embrace that where it does something good for you. After that, Dan will be preaching a message called The Daily Grind, The Aroma of Life. And if you're a coffee drinker, that one is going to smell delicious. So you're not going to want to miss that one. And then uh, Ben Pearson, he's going to finish off the series and talk about what it means to have an act of worship through the daily grind. But today, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about the vision of the church. And if you have been attending this church for a few years now, you would have heard a very similar sermon to this uh, last year, because the vision of the church doesn't change. We don't change. Uh, the strategy of how we fulfill that vision might change, but the vision of the church doesn't change because we're not there yet. We haven't fulfilled the vision that we feel like God has placed on our heart. So I want to talk about the vision of the church, the vision of your church. It's so good to know what you're a part of, and if today is your first time at The Rock, there's no better Sunday for you to have come because we're going to peek behind the curtains a little bit about why we do the things that we do. Why we do the things that we do. It's been about two years now since we've changed the course in the way that we do church, and it's been an amazing journey. Now, I was reflecting on this a couple of weeks ago, and it just almost brought me to tears just how much God has been doing through this group of people. It's just been amazing. And what's made it so amazing is you. It's you. The reason why we're growing isn't because of the preaching or even the music or our amazing kids program. It's because of you and how welcome you make people feel and how much this feels like home when people walk through the doors. And there are so many people a part of this church that serve and volunteer, but I think that makes what makes these people so special, what makes you special, is every church has volunteers. Every church has people that serve. But what I love about you is that you are bought in, engaged leaders. Not just serving, not just volunteering. You are bought in, engaged leaders, and you've embraced our mission, and you've embraced our vision. What we've tried to do for the last couple of years, and it's still a process, and it will be a long process, is we want to remove any unnecessary tradition that many churches have that have become common in most churches, but these traditions that might actually be getting in the way of the mission of the local church. And Jesus established this mission. It's sort of a non-negotiable. If you're a church in this world, this is the mission of the church, is to make disciples, to make disciples, make disciples. So wherever there is a church, people should be starting to follow Jesus. Another way you could put it is to draw people to Jesus. Our, we frame our mission statement as we want to champion people into becoming devoted followers of Christ. That's the mission of the rock. And for us, what we ask ourselves is, what is the most efficient, most effective way Christians can impact their community by influencing other people? Not to get them into something so we can get something from people, but because most of us here would agree that Jesus offered something to us. Jesus offered something to us, and it's our responsibility to simply offer that to the people around us, to offer what Jesus has offered us to those in our community. And you know what? 2,000 years ago, the church was going through a very similar thing, where they had to sort of make, make or break some deeply held traditions and answer the question, what is the best way we can fulfill the mission of the church? What is the best way we can draw people to Jesus? 2,000 years ago, they were trying to figure out what obstacles are there in place? What man-made traditions have we established that are preventing people from coming to follow Jesus? What are they and how can we get rid of them? And as you may know, most of Jesus' followers in the first century were Jewish. They, they had their own beliefs, their own Bible. Jesus was Jewish. 
Jesus seemed to be the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. So it made perfect sense for some Jewish people in the first century to think Jesus was just a continuation of what already had been going on before. I want to take a quick time out. Some of the ideas that you'll hear or yeah, things I'll say this morning uh, are inspired by the book Deep and Wide. It's by Andy Stanley. It's an amazing book. If you'd like to get more depth into this, I encourage you to read the book Deep and Wide. All right, let's continue. So it made perfect sense for people to think that this was just a continuation of what already had been going on. Because of that, to become a Jesus follower, you had to become Jewish. But this was a complicated process to become Jewish as an adult. It meant you had to have a whole new worldview. You had to memorize 600 plus laws. And I'm not just saying like so you could recite them. They had to be like knowing the back of your hand. You had to know them. You had to be able to live them out. Plus, if you had to become circumcised. I mean, it was not easy as an adult to become a Jewish person. But there were a lot of Jewish Christians at this time who's, who said that it's complicated. They were saying, it's complicated, but we've been doing this our whole lives. So why don't you just put your big boy pants on and why don't you do what we've been doing our whole lives? Because to become a Jesus follower, you're going to have to become Jewish. That's what many Jewish Christians were saying in the first century. So there was this conflict within the church. There was this big conflict. And it all sort of came to a head about 20 years after the resurrection. And this went on for the first 20 years of the church history. And finally, there was a meeting in Jerusalem. It was the very first church meeting that was recorded for us and is found in the book of Acts chapter 15. Here's what happened. So a, a group from both sides of this argument uh, came together. One group would say Gentiles, so non-Jewish people, they have to, to become Jew Jesus followers, you have to become Jewish. Gentiles have to become Jewish to become Christians because Jesus was Jewish and he was the Messiah. So you got to get on board with this. So that was one side over here. The other side said, no, 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 because Jesus, this isn't a continuation of what we've known, what Jesus has come. This is something that's brand new. You don't need to become Jewish to become a Jesus follower. That is the, that's the old way. Jesus came to introduce something brand new. This is new. So we have two sides of the argument. One, that you've got to become Jewish to become a Jesus follower. And one, and so that side saying, this is a continuation of what we've known for our whole life. And this side is saying, no, this is something that's brand new. We don't need to become Jewish to become a Jesus follower. So there is this conflict. There is this conflict. Was it a continuation or was it new? And finally, the apostle Peter, who was a big deal in the early church, he was one of Jesus' closest followers. Peter gets up and gives this speech and says, look, I understand why you think Christians need to become Jewish before they can become Jesus followers. I used to believe that too. I can understand why you'd say that, why you think it's a continuation. I used to think that until I had an encounter with a Gentile in a Gentile home with a man named Cornelius. Then Paul got up and he said, I agree with Peter. I've been traveling all over the Gentile world and all over the Gentile world, men and women are embracing Jesus as their savior. They're embracing Jesus as the one who has come to the earth to save them from their sins. I agree with what Peter is saying. I do not believe that they need, we need to be, Gentiles need to become Jewish to become Jesus followers. So this argument sort of went back and forth, went back and forth. It's a continuation. No, it's something brand new. But finally, they came to the conclusion that Gentiles, they did not need to become Jewish to become a Jesus follower. And if you go, oh, that's a great story, John. Well, by the way, you were at stake, unless you're a Jewish person, in this meeting, the first meeting ever recorded, you were at stake in this meeting. I mean, how amazing is it that we don't need to memorize 600 laws, that we don't need to become circumcised as an adult to become a Jesus follower? We were at stake in this very crucial meeting. You can thank Peter and Paul. Now, at the end of this meeting, this is why I'm telling you, all of this. At the end of this meeting, James, who is the brother of Jesus, James had a lot of influence in the early church after the resurrection because he was the brother of Jesus. And I mean, 
Can you imagine the stories that James could tell about Jesus if you have brothers? Anyhow. Anyway, James, the brother of Jesus, stands up in his meeting, and he makes a statement. And I want you to listen to this, because this statement that James makes is a statement that we base everything off, base everything we do at the rock off of. This is what it says. James stands up at the end of this meeting. He says, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. So here's a summary of this whole argument. Here's the conclusion of this whole meeting wrapped up into one statement, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. In other words, anything, anything that is an unnecessary obstacle, anything that's going to hinder a Gentile from turning to God, we should remove it. We should not do anything that makes it difficult for a Gentile who is turning to God. And as the Rock Christian family, this is what we filter everything we do from. From our budgeting, how we spend our money. From how we prepare our messages. From how we uh, do music in the morning. From how we run our connect groups to our children's ministry, to our hospitality. Everything we do, we filter through this one statement that we should not make it difficult for those who are turning to God. We are a church for everyone. This is where we get that statement. We are a church for everyone. So, so we decided that we want to do a lot of stuff for Christians, for church people. We want to do a lot of stuff for families. And we're still working this out and how this looks. But at the end of the day, we want to be a group of people who took the words of James to heart. That these words that James spoke in this very crucial meeting aren't just words on a page in a Bible, but we want to take them to heart, and we want to apply these words to everything that we do. And we have been, and we are going to continue to remove unnecessary obstacles for people who are turning to God, for people that are curious about God, for people that are interested about God, that nothing would get in the way except for one thing. One thing should get in the way. There's only one thing that should get in the way of people who are turning to God. And it's this question, who is Jesus? At the end of the day, that is all that matters, right? That's all that matters. Who is Jesus? It doesn't matter how we do our worship set on a Sunday morning. It doesn't even matter what I come up here and say. The only thing that matters, the only thing that prevents someone to turning to Jesus is them answering that question is who is Jesus? Everything else is just, can be an obstacle. Who is Jesus? And at some point, everyone has to answer that question. You have to answer that question. I have to answer that question. And in everyone's life, you got to answer that question. Who is Jesus? But in the meantime, we as a group of uh, people, some of us in here are church people. Some of, them, some of us in here are brand new to church. Maybe this is your first time. But we as a group of people should do everything that we can to make it easy for those who are trying to figure out that question. Who are trying to wrestle that question to the floor. Who is Jesus? And I'm gonna, gonna do in just a couple of minutes is talk about how we do that. I wanna talk about how we do that. How do we make space for that? And the, the big word here is we. Because it's not me. It's not just a selected group of people. This is a we thing. This is an everybody thing. The reason you need to know this is you are the church. You are the church. And as you go, we go. This is an everybody thing. Now again, if this is your first time back in church after being out of church for a long time, or someone invited you, or someone bribed you with free coffee this morning, whatever got you here, it doesn't matter. It just, all that matters is that you're here and that you know that we are glad that you are here. It doesn't matter how you got here. We're just glad that you are here because this is the perfect Sunday for you to be here because today we're going to pull back the curtains and talk about why we do what we do. So if there's any question in your mind about what is these people's agendas, what are these people up to, there's going to be no question at the end. We are going to make it clear 
and I will make it clear up front so you don't have to wonder. You don't have to wonder what our agenda is. Here it is. Here's why we do what we do. We believe that following Jesus makes your life better and makes you better at life. That's it. We believe that following Jesus makes your life better and makes you better at life. And the reason we believe that is because following Jesus has made our lives better, has made us better at life. We're not trying to earn our way into heaven or into God's good books because what we believe is that was already done for us by the cross. And the Christian life is simply a response to God's grace and mercy in this world. So our agenda is this. We are convinced, and we would love to convince you as gently as possible, is that your life would be better if you were following Jesus. And it will make your life better. If you choose to follow Jesus, it will make you a better husband. If you choose to follow Jesus, it will make you a better wife. If you choose to follow Jesus, it will make you a better son, a better daughter, a better employee, a better employer, a better student, a better brother, a better sister. If you choose to follow Jesus, you will be better at everything. So we believe that following Jesus will make you better at life and it will make your life better because it has done that for us. It has done that for us. So we're going to talk about why we do what we do. Because as a member, as an attendee, as an engaged leader of this church, you are a very, very, very important part of it. So here's the bottom line. In case you have to leave early or you zone out or fall asleep or you came for the coffee and you have a coffee headache because you haven't had it yet, I, want you, I just want to say it straight up so that we don't miss it. We want guests to know that we know that you're here and we're happy about it. We want guests to know that we know that you're here and that we're happy about it. Whether you're a, a non-church goer, whether you think what we believe is completely ridiculous, whether you're a skeptic or you're an out-of-town guest or you're just visiting from another church, we want guests to know that we know that you're here and we're happy about it. That's the bottom line. Regardless of their background, regardless of the beliefs, you could, you could put it this way. This is our mantra. We want to assume guests in the room. Assume guests in the room. This is a way bigger deal than you might think. Because you may have been to a church before, or grown up in a church, or seen a church where when you're leaving the church, there's a sign on the way out that says you are now entering the mission field. And let me tell you, church, that is not us. Because the assumption is with that sign that we are all in here and they are all out there. That we're in here and they're out there. We are not that church. And we will not be that church as long as you help us ensure that we never become that church. Because we are we. We are we. And no matter who you are or where you lie on the spiritual continuum, you are welcome here. You are welcome here. Because what we know is that we're not that different. We get up at the same time. We go to the same kind of jobs. We play the same sports. We put our clothes on the same way. There's so many similarity, some similarities that the idea that we are some sort of strange alien group of people that is unlike people out there is absolutely completely false. There is no us and they. There is just a we. And some of us has discovered something extraordinary that following Jesus will make your life better and make, your, make you better at life. So the mandate is we want to assume guests in the room. Now, I, I want to give you three questions to talk about briefly that will help fill in the gaps a little bit and get you thinking about this because this is for everyone. And this is sort of what, uh, when I'm planning for a service or we're planning for a service, these are the three questions that, that we ask. And I would love you to ask these questions when you step foot inside this building or when you see something on social media or any sort of communication. The three questions are this. What do they see? What do they hear? What do they experience? What do they see? What do they hear? What do they experience? 
let's talk about the first one. What do they see? Does our facility look like we're expecting guests and their children? This is a really big one. This is a big deal for me. Let me ask you a question. When does your house look the best? When there's guests. Your house looks the best when there's guests. I mean, sometimes it looks like there's no signs of living when guests are coming over to our house. It is clean, deep clean. I mean, bleach. Uh, our, our house looks guest best when we're expecting guests. And so should ours. So should this church. So should this building. This is a big deal. And like, we're all on rubbish pickup. We're all janitors. We are all custodians. We are all... If there's a bathroom and you're, that's dirty and you're wondering who is responsible for cleaning this, you just look in the mirror because you're looking at them, right? We all take responsibility for having a clean house. We take a responsibility to make sure that guests feel honored when they walk through our doors. Just a few months ago, I loved this. Uh, this was, sorry, a few years ago. Um, I've told this story before, but there was a family in this church that realized that if a baby does a poo, there's nowhere to change the baby. The, there was no change table. It was just sort of awkward. And as a parent, that's actually quite a big deal. And that in itself can be an obstacle as to coming to church. And so this family decided that they would just get a portable uh, change table and put it in the bathroom so that other families, so that guests could come and change a pooey diaper in peace. How good is that? Such a little thing, but that made such a huge difference. And it shares that the, this family had the vision in their hearts. And the mantra. Another part of this question is, do guests see themselves when they come to our church? What do I mean, like, what do I mean by this? We want guests, no matter who they are, whether they are a family, a child, elderly, single, married, part of a bikey gang, I don't know, whoever they are, to be able to find someone like them in the church. Because they might not believe what we believe. They might not believe in the same thing, but at least they can relate. What do they see? Second question. What do they hear? Do we have a good reputation in the community? When people hear the Rock Christian family, what comes to mind? Do we have a good reputation? And let me tell you, church, you knock this one out of the park. The amount of involvement that you have in events in our community is amazing. Uh, whether it's stable on the strand, so many of you volunteer every year around Christmas time to make uh, Christmas a memorable time in Townsville. The Global Leadership Summit. This conference is having more and more influence in our community, and we believe that we're just getting started that it's just going to take off, and there are more and more people from all different areas of influence in Townsville that attend the Global Leadership Summit that couldn't happen without you. Do we have a good reputation in the community? When we hear people say the Rock Christian family, we don't want people to think, oh, I know where that is, and that's a nice church. I mean, that's okay. We want people to say, I am so glad that this church is in our community, and I never want them to leave. Not just, that's a nice church, and uh, that's at the Modern Conference Center at the hospital. No, that, that this is a pivotal church in our community. And church, I'll be honest, we're still working on this one. We're still working on how we can have a bigger impact within the community in ta of Townsville. But here's the bottom line. You are our reputation in the community. You're it. You are the reputation of this church in the community. You are an ambassador, yes, for Jesus, but you are an ambassador for this church who are try, trying to make it easy for those who are turning to God. And I could not be more proud to have a group of people to be the ambassador for this church. I mean, it's unbelievable. What do people see? What do people hear? And was it engaging? What else do they hear? Was, it, was the communication engaging? Whether it's through our music, through our kids' church program, through our Connect booth, through our uh, Rock Connect groups, was communication engaging? Was the content helpful? We want to make sure people know what to do with what we say. 
This is why you will often hear me say things like, if you are new to church or wouldn't call yourself a follower of Jesus, you don't have to do this. But if you want to, you can try, you can try this at home because it will make your life better. We want to make sure that everybody comes through this doors, knows what to do with what we say. Because there's it's one thing to know a lot of stuff. But I'm, I'm going to be interest, I'm going to be honest. I'm not 100% sold on just knowing a lot of stuff. I think we need to do a lot of stuff. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus is always talking about it's not just enough to listen. It's not enough just to hear. That's not enough. You need to do what we are talking about. It's like having unapplied paint. I've talked about this a few weeks ago. In a paint bucket, that paint is just sitting there. It's a bit useless if it's not being applied to the wall. It's the application to the wall that makes the difference. Your house isn't going to look a lot better if you don't put the paint on the walls. That's what the application is like. We want people to know what to do with what we're saying. So what do they see? What do they hear? What do they experience is the third question. Was it genuine? Are we authentic? Are we real? Are you approachable? Are you likable? You've heard me say this before. People who are nothing like Jesus seem to like Jesus. People who are nothing like Jesus seem to like Jesus. People should like us. People should like us. We should be the most likable people in the community because we are Jesus followers. And what did Jesus do? Jesus didn't come to correct. Jesus came to connect. He didn't correct first. He connected first. That's the example that we need to be following in the community. We need to be there to connect with our community, not correct them. That's just nonsense. Did we show respect for the values and views of our guests? You're so good at this, church, and let's keep this up. Here's the thing. Everyone's views and values make perfect sense to them. Everyone's set of values makes perfect sense to them. So when someone's views don't make sense to me, who's the, who has the problem? It's me. It's me. I, I don't understand why you did that. I don't understand why you believe that. I don't understand how you could do that. So who's the person that doesn't understand? It's not them. It's me. See, there's so much space, so much room in this church for people that don't hold our views and people that don't hold our values. And we don't feel compelled to bear down and force people to believe what we believe and embrace our values. That doesn't work anyway. You know that. We respect people's views and we respect people's values just like you would want them to respect your views and your values. This is why, again, sometimes when I am doing a sermon or when Dan or when Ben, when we are doing application, we will give an opt out to the application because we have no right telling people that haven't submitted themselves to Jesus how to live their life. We don't have that right because... First of all, they're smart of people. They, they can, if, if someone hasn't become a follower of Jesus, I don't have the authority to tell people how to live their lives. But I always say you're welcome to try it because I know, I know and you know this, that even if you don't believe it, being a follower of Jesus, following his example will make your life better and make you better at life. And just remember, what was his invitation? Jesus' invitation was to follow me. Follow me. He didn't often say obey me at first, not even believe in me at first. He just said, follow me. In fact, the first church planter, the man who planted the very first church, he went as far as to say this in 1 Corinthians 5.12. He says this, What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? To wag my finger and say, I can't believe you did that. What business is it of mine? And you know this. If the church historically did a better job at this, there would be a lot more people inside the church. If we did a better job at not judging those outside the church, we would have a lot more people inside the church. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case, because unfortunately, Christians have been known for a very long time to be very judgmental people, and that breaks my heart. 
The people outside the church, they don't hold your standards and your values anyway. So we don't have any business holding people to a standard they never embraced to begin with. And you know this because this is most likely how most people came to faith. We should be attractive. We should be an attractive group of people, not coercive. Someone should attract you to faith, not bend your arm to be a part of faith. We should be attractive. Paul wrote this. He says, it is your kindness, Lord, that leads us to repentance. You know, it's not like a con act to lead someone to repentance. It is his kindness that leads us to repentance. Did we respond quickly, directively, and personally? Do we make church feel personal? And again, you're so good at this. Many of us are here not because of what happens up front from worship to preaching, but because someone else in this church made you feel welcome. That's why so, that's why so many of us are here. So the three questions that I want you to ask all the time, if you could help us act these, ask these questions, if we can all ask these questions, is what do people see? What do people hear? And what do they experience? And please never forget, never, never forget that you are the church. That your church will never be better than you. That our church will never be better than us. And if, even if we don't fully believe, even if you don't fully believe in what we believe, or fully embrace the values that we hold, or don't become fully devoted followers of Christ, which is our mission statement, when they think about us, that they would say, I am glad that that church is in our community. So let's continue to be a church for everyone. And for those of you who are engaged, who are engaged leaders, who serve, who volunteer, who give, who show up early, stay late, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you do because you are a part of every single story that comes from this church. And if you might be sitting here and you're grateful but you not, might not be engaged yet, we would love to offer you that invitation to get involved in what's happening here. Uh, whether that means volunteering or serving or being a part of a Rock Connect group, however that looks for you, we'd love to see how you can get involved at the Rock Christian family. Let me pray. God, thank you that you have called us to be a church for everyone a church for everyone, and uh, God, would you continue to highlight obstacles that are in the way of people that are turning to you? Because we don't want to get in the way of what you want to do in people's lives. So God, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.